Welcome everyone to the Vox Box here in the European Parliament in Brussels and this EPP group talk on combating and preventing child sexual abuse online. My name is Jack Parrock and I'm delighted to be hosting this conversation here. With me here today, I have Xavier Zazalejos, who is an MEP and the rapporteur on the proposal for a regulation of the European Parliament and of the Council, the European Council, to prevent and combat child sexual abuse. Great to see you today. Thank you. Yeah, good to see you. We also have, joining us via video link from The Hague, Jean-Philippe Lecouf, who's the Deputy Director of Europol. Thank you so much for being with us, Jean-Philippe. Yeah, good evening. Happy to be with you. Yeah, it's going to be great to hear your thoughts. And we also have Antonio Labrador Jimenez, who's from the European Commission, a team leader in DG Home on the fight against child sexual abuse. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi, Jack. Great to be here. So, um, we are, stay with us, we're going to delve uh, into the urgent need for effective measures to safeguard children in the digital realm and we're also going to talk about strategies. How can we create a safer online environment for our younger generations? So there's a proposal on the table from May 2022 which was put forward by the Commission to protect children in the long term and we'll get into all of that a little bit more but before we do I just want to let our listeners know that while we're going to be very delicate in our discussion we may touch on some things which could be triggering for victims of sexual abuse during the show and victims of child sexual abuse as well during the course of the show. Now there's a figure here which I think is quite astonishing. The European, uh, the Council of Europe reports that about one in five children in Europe are victims of some form of sexual violence. So this isn't some small side prom problem that we're talking about that we can just forget about. And that's the purpose of us having this discussion today. So turning to you, Javier, thank you so much for, for hosting this discussion and being part of this file, which is so important. The regulation has aroused some controversy, um, especially with the, in relation to sort of internet users' privacy rights. I wonder if you can just talk us a little bit through the regulation and the proposal and where we are with it right now. Well, first of all, I think that it is absolutely um, normal that uh, this kind of regulation may arise a uh, public controversy in a pluralistic society with different options. Um, the important thing is that uh, there is, this is not just a, a zero-sum game. Either we protect uh, the um, uh, rights of, of children who are abused, or we protect the rights of the uh, internet users. If that will be the case, we will simply do it. That is not uh, the way we are working. We are working on a, a very serious proposal by the, by the Commission, and uh, of course it's open to the um, discussion of the, uh, of the Parliament. I think it is important to um, underline five, four main uh, features in this. First, it will be mandatory for all companies offering services, digital services in the European Union, to conduct a risk assessment. The risk assessment is the basic um, uh, cornerstone of the uh, regulation. According to the risk assessment, showing how vulnerable their services are to um, the uh, risk of being uh, misused for child abuse, sex, uh, sexual um, child abuse, um, they will have to adopt and propose uh, the kind of mitigation measures that are deemed appropriate and proportionate to, the, to those risks. Um, um, there will be, in those cases in which these mitigation measures are not sufficient, uh, there will be a judicial order uh, to um, define specifically what kind of detection measures have to be, uh, have to be taken. Um, and uh, uh, finally, there is a very important innovation, which is the setting up of the EU Centre to uh, prevent uh, child sexual abuse will, will, uh, will be a pillar of the whole regulation, a real, the, the, uh, I mean, a role in the hub, but also a leading institution in the fight against uh, child sexual abuse online. So uh, this is a, um, the, the approach we are having is, um, is reasonable, and I'm very uh, confident that in the end we will be able to gather the broadest uh, support um, uh, behind this uh, regulation, which is, which is crucial. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those kind of things which needs delicacy, but it also needs to be done. And I think Absolutely. often within the sort of political family of the EU, these things 
hopefully don't get too politicised as they move forward. I'm going to come to you, Jean-Philippe. Obviously, crime, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's moved online. Uh, there's so much that, that needs to be focused on. The internet knows no borders, and we know that in the European Union on many different sort of online issues. What's Europol's role in bringing justice in these cases, specifically around organised child sex abuse net networks that operate globally? It's a really difficult job for you, right? Yes, it is, uh, absolutely. But, um, you know, it's uh, 20 years now that uh, Europol is working on this uh, topic. We have a dedicated team uh, for 20 years. We call them uh, analyst project twins. And uh, it's uh, very highly specialized investigators that are working on this topic of child sexual abuse, trying to, uh, to detect, but also uh, to prevent uh, these uh, sexual abuse uh, online to happen by finding the perpetrators and safeguarding the victims, the young victims. Uh, our the core business in this is really the data analysis and the operational coordination and operational support. So, um, in fact, we receive a lot of uh, data um, from important uh, foreign partners, uh, especially from uh, the US, and we need to have our own capacity to do that. I think it, in Europe, I think it's very important. And from this data, this uh, child sexual abuse material, we try to find where it happens, to find the jurisdictions, and then to trigger investigation with partner countries. Uh, in 2022, for example, we have supported uh, 93 of these uh, major investigations on child sexual abuse perpetrators. And uh, we safeguard some uh, victims. And it's, it's for us, uh, as soon as the investigation has started, we follow and we continue to support this investigation, to coordinate this investigation, uh, because it's, as you said, it knows no border, it's worldwide. So we need really to have a coalition of countries, uh, of law enforcement agencies to work on that, and judicial authorities, in order to, uh, to try to safeguard these poor young victims. Yeah, and that's what it's really all about. At the end of the day, it's to try and like, really protect the victims, and that's the, the focus. So how did the Commission come up with the, this regulation, with that? In, in, in mind, Antonio, what, what exactly does it set out to do and why is it so important right now? It's very important right now because uh, we are failing to protect uh, children uh, in the EU. The figure of uh, one in five children being victim of uh, one form of uh, sexual violence that you mentioned at the beginning is actually a conservative one. Mm. Other studies, like a recent one in Spain, will indicate that uh, actually it's doubled than that. Two out of five uh, adults indicate that they were uh, victims of uh, sexual abuse when they were children. I understand that this is a difficult issue to talk about, uh, that it's difficult to recognize that uh, something as horrible as this uh, could be happening in our society. But the reality is that uh, it is happening on, uh, at a massive uh, scale. But as difficult as it may be to talk about it, it's more difficult for children that suffer these abuses, which have devastated consequences uh, for them. Internet uh, has facilitated uh, these crimes. It has made it easier for offenders to exchange uh, material and communicate uh, with each other. It has made it easier the distribution of uh, child sexual abuse material globally. And uh, it has uh, facilitated the creation of a global market uh, for this material that constantly increases the demand for new material and therefore for uh, new abuses. And it has made it easier for offenders to contact uh, children to sexually abuse them. And we see that the situation is uh, only worsening. Uh, we see that uh, the number of uh, reports concerning, of child sexual abuse concerning the EU increased from 23,000 in 
2010 to 1.5 million mm. in 2022. It's huge. An increase of half a million from the previous year. And the number of uh, reports concerning the grooming, so the online solicitation of children for sexual purposes, doubled in the EU uh, last year. So um, we see also that uh, this number is likely to get uh, even worse. There was a recent uh, report uh, from Europol on uh, chat GPT and the risk that it represents uh, mm -hmm. for uh, children uh, online. Now offenders, when they reach out to a child, they have to do it manually, one by one. Mm. The situation is already bad now, but imagine what would be when these offenders have uh, dozens of uh, chatbots uh, reaching out to children in a very uh, realistic way. And companies are not taking responsibility for this. Yet. Yet. <laughs> That's where regulation comes in. Exactly. Right? There is no obligation at the moment uh, for companies to combat uh, these crimes. They do it on a voluntary basis. What is the result? That most companies don't do anything. Mm. You know? Last year, 90% of the child sexual abuse uh, reports uh, were sent by three companies out of the hundreds and thousands of companies yeah. that are reporting uh, today. I think it's very important what Antonio is saying because we, we have to emphasize the appalling scale of the of the uh, of the problem and it's uh, and it's really it's really terrible. The latest uh, report by Internet, Internet Watch Foundation shows that, for example, over 50 50 percent of the reports um, are um, self-generated um, CSAM uh, as a result, usually, of sexual extortion uh, on, on 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 children. Also, we know that um, uh, so far the, the um, uh, victims um, uh, mostly affected by, by CISAM uh, were between um, 11, 14 years. Now it's between 7 and 10 years. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the, I mean we have just, to act on let, that. Let me just stop you because it's, re it's really yeah. important what you did. You, you used the term that we haven't explained yet, which is CISAM. And I know Jean-Philippe. Yeah. You're very, very keen on making sure that we use the correct terminology around this so that we call it child sexual abuse material and not pornography. Can you explain? Yes, sure. I think this terminology is really key. As you know, everything starts with the words, huh? with the verb. Uh, the terminology is really key in this field. Why? Because child sexual abuse um, it is a crime that we cannot take lightly. Um, if we speak about pornography, pornography is a term that is used for adults that are engaging in a relation most of the time with a consensual uh, and distributed to the public uh, quite uh, openly. Yeah. But when children are involved, it's not pornography. It's abuse. It's a crime. So we have to name this as it is. That is to say, exploitation, abuse of children. And uh, if it's uh, sexual, but it's not only sexual most of the time. It escalates with uh, children being hurt, being re beaten, and so on. So. I think that it's really important that, and in Europol, we encourage to use the right terminology. This is not pornography again. Mm -hmm. This is abuse uh, uh, about children exactly. and exploitation of children. Yeah, and it's really crucial that there are no blurred lines. There's so many blurred lines online. But, Absolutely. Uh, but this, I mean, it can be blurred, but it absolutely must not be, right? So turning back to you, Javier, I mean, the detractors of the new regulations sort of think that the technology is not reliable enough mm -hmm. at the moment. We've already mentioned ChatGDP and the AIs that are coming up that mm -hmm. are very, very uh, impressive and scary, maybe, mm -hmm. depending on where you stand on it at the moment. Um, what are the new obligations on providers and how will they sort of amount to false positives or not? Mm. And do you think the regulation is sort of going to undermine encryptions? And, and there's a lot of issues around that. I wonder if you can give us an outline. Well, I have to, to, to deny that um, 
due to an allegation of technology available not being accurate enough mm. to um, uh, provide a, uh, a, a detection with uh, reasonable rate errors. Mm. Not at all. Um, one of the things that strikes me most is that while we have seen that technology is evolving and developing and at a staggering pace, um, we um, or some of the critics of this uh, regulation also refers to the technology available as um, it was uh, just a stop of five years ago. It has evolved. The algorithms are more accurate, are set at a very low um, error rate. For example, the, um, there is n almost no error rate in the detection of already known CSAM, which is, uh, has been hashed and is stored in databases. But the um, Commission in the impact assessment of the regulation uh, showed that uh, uh, technologies uh, that can be used to detect new CSAM uh, can be, uh, the algorithm can be, can be rated at 99.9 percent .9 of uh, of accuracy. That's nothing to do with that. And on the other hand, Jack, if you allow me, I mean, we all accept that, for example, our mail um, be a scan in order to detect spam, or mm. our communications uh, could be a scan to detect malware, or if we go to an airport, we are not suspicious, we are not involved in any kind of terrorist plot, but we have to put our, our suitcase and go through the scan, and we accept that because we think there is a risk involved, and we accept that our mail can be a scan uh, in order to prevent our letters to contain uh, explosives of, or, or drugs, and it doesn't mean that the post service of the um, security of officer which is in the airport um, knows exactly what we have in our suitcase or what, what we have written in our letters. Uh, so, I mean, why do not have we do not have the same approach when uh, such an, 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 an heinous crime is involved, such as uh, child sexual abuse, when we can apply technologies we that don't have access to, to the content of the communication mm. and simply have to recognize whether there is a potential system with a high degree of accuracy and with a guarantee that at the end of the process there will always be a human review. So, um, in, in my opinion, we have to, um, to try to have a, a more nuanced approach to that, a more nuanced debate, and to be sure that not only the conditions, the current conditions of technology, but also the safeguards uh, built in the regulation, and the, the Parliament will discuss them extensively, uh, and make um, a process which is safe and respectful for uh, the fundamental rights of the users. I'm a user, I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, and uh, of course I'm very sensitive to that. I wouldn't like to see the, the pictures of my grandchildren playing uh, on the beach uh, being flagged as, as, as is, and they are not, and no. that won't happen. That won't happen. Yeah, I mean, and there is enough technology. I think what, what's really interesting that you raised there is this sort of idea of you know, what we are prepared to confront. And I think one of the things with, with child sexual abuse material is it's so horrific that people sort of struggle to engage with the idea of it. And that's why conversations like this are important. I'm going to come to you, Antonio, back sort of on the, the regulation proposal. We heard from Javier this idea, sort of the technology of five years ago. And the technology in five years' time is going to be very different. So I wonder if you can explain the sort of idea of this as a sort of living regulation that will change and adapt and how the thinking in the Commission has, has sort of come, uh, come, come in on that, that to make sure that this is dynamic and it's going to work. Yes, indeed. Uh, one of the uh, key principles of the proposal is uh, technological neutrality and future-proofness. Mm. We are setting out here a legal instrument uh, for the long term, a legal instrument that puts in place uh, the principles uh, that uh, should be used uh, for the prevention and the combating of uh, child sexual abuse uh, online. And these principles uh, have to be technology neutral and uh, future proof so that uh, the le legislation does not become outdated uh, mm. in uh, no time, mm. seeing the pace of development of the technologies uh, that we are seeing today. Yeah. It's, it's really, really important. Um, I'm going to come to you, uh, Jean Philippe, again. The trend behind sort of sexual um, extortion and coercion, can you explain that a little bit? And, and why perhaps, in your opinion and your understanding from, from your work there at Europol, do you see that perhaps victims are afraid to report cases like this? 
Well, the, the, um, the sextortion or the uh, online coercion or extortion, uh, it's, uh, as you know, the, uh, a kind of cr a criminal trick in order to, to push the victims to share explicit images uh, or videos of them that they can use afterwards to blackmail the, the, the victim. Well, for sure, it's a, it's a trend that is raising because, uh, because of the, the, the exposure. We are in a digital age, so youngsters are exposed with, uh, with mobile devices, with uh, internet coverage, and so on. So criminals are counting on this kind of uh, sextortion uh, to, to push the victims to share more and more images. And it's where these recruitment are done through uh, exchange of uh, conversation, simple conversation that, can, that starts really as a very friendly one and then after turns to, to become uh, um, this uh, uh, extortion of, uh, of images towards the, the victims. Um, we uh, really see that happening more and more. Uh, I think uh, it's important also to say that when this happened, there's a reluctance from the victims to go to the law enforcement agency, to the police, or even to their parents to say. So we, we must uh, tell them that they, if this happened, they have to seize immediately any contact and to report this. Uh, we tried to build, and we have built in Europe a campaign on that, which is uh, named Say No, Say No campaign. It's a, it's a 10 minutes video for youngsters to, uh, to explain uh, what happened and to explain what is the good thing to do when you are taken in such an extortion. But again, it's linked with uh, this child sexual abuse uh, system where, where through grooming, in fact, some perpetrators try to, uh, to push uh, and to uh, uh, the, the, the poor victims to share more and more images of themselves uh, by, by the, this uh, threat to reveal that they have shared the first image. So it's, it's really uh, uh, also something that is important to fight against and to raise the awareness also. Yeah, I mean, this is totally it because if you, I mean, perpetrators of this crime can sit at a laptop anywhere in the world and extract this material, this horrific material from people willingly, especially young teenagers, um, you know, who are really green and, and you know, having, having difficult times going through their sort of process of puberty and stuff, it can be really complicated. And Jack, uh, it may take uh, minutes uh, for an yeah. offender to extract uh, those images uh, from a child. And uh, in some cases, uh, it may take uh, hours bef in between the first uh, contact of the offender and uh, the child taking uh, his own life, like right. it happened yeah. in a series of uh, cases in the US uh, recently to the point that the FBI had to issue a public uh, national security alert uh, mm -hmm. because of those cases. There were gangs of uh, offenders uh, out of uh, West Africa that were extorting these children uh, ruthlessly for money. Mm -hmm. And even after they took their own lives, they continue extorting their families and, yeah. and the girlfriends uh, ruthlessly. Yeah. I mean, this is it. Yeah. We, we already know that they have no fans. Yeah. They don't care about the victims. That's the... That's the... They're demanding money. And if they can pay, then say, well, but you have a, you have a, a younger brother, no? Oh. Uh, take a jungle brother and again produce no images of, of that. There are two important things that I, I, I would like to say about this. First, it can happen everywhere. Yeah. So the idea that this can happen to me, this can happen to my children, this can happen uh, in my home, uh, that is not true. Mm -hmm. They're all under the same risk and this is something that we have to bear in mind. Second, victims and survivors are important and I think that we a, a, a very, a, a very important part of the fight against uh, um, uh, these heinous crime 
uh, has to be built on the on the testimony on the sample of uh, of victims and survivors. That's why I have proposed uh, to the, the the creation of a um, victims consultative forum within the EU centre. Because I mean, I'm fully respectful. With, let me, let me with ask that. about this yeah. centre because this is something that you're, yeah. you're in favour of: is creating a centre yeah. to deal with child sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And my question would be: How do you make sure that the onus isn't only on the victims to protect themselves, but also on the perpetrators mm -hmm. to make sure that there is justice for them, or stopping people from getting involved in this yeah. thing in the first place? Well, that's right. There are two, two dimensions of this of this mm. issue. One is the, the the dimension that this file want to to address, which is basically the dissemination, the production of the dissemination and the prevention of the dissemination and exchange of these images. And the other one is the law enforcement uh, dimension in which once this uh, material has been detected that a police investigation or a judicial investigation has to start according with the, the, uh, the, 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 the procedures. Um, and there are two um, separate um, issues. Uh, of course, they are related, but separate. We are not dealing with a law enforcement uh, regulation this is we are not creating crimes uh, so our primary purpose is to um, uh, detect and remove that kind of, of material of course all that will be reported uh, to the uh, to the EU center and the EU center would decide what to do with that material uh, once it has uh, come. and then comes the um, an enormous and, and I would say painstaking and um, extremely valuable work of the of police enforcement agency. You have to bear in mind that something I have always, um, I, I could never commend enough, um, uh, those, um, those people of uh, law enforcement agencies who have to sit before a screen and, and, and watch and examine and try to recognize and, 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 and detect uh, what is in those horrible um, images, the enormous psychological toll that it takes uh, from them when they come back to their, to their homes their and children. see their children and their families. It's, it's amazing yeah. of the, the job they're, they're doing. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good question for you, actually, Jean-Philippe. I mean, how, how do you confront that? And on that, how do you work across borders? Because this has to be done not just by Europol, but by national police forces as well. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I can give you an example because I think it's very significant. A few days ago, in fact, last week, we ended just uh, the, the 12th edition of what we called the Victim Identification Task Force that we have in Europol. We gathered in Europol more than 20 specialists coming from 14 countries this time with, uh, that goes into this uh, child sexual abuse material and they try to find the victims, but also uh, any clue that can give us an indication of where this, the perpetrators of these acts are committed. And last week, for example, with our Italian colleagues, we have been able to find a major perpetrators. The guy was hiding for nine years, and from nine years, he was abusing his, uh, uh, his children and posting the material online. He was very well known in the community as the shadow man because nobody can find him. And thanks to this cooperation, thanks to this work here at Europol, we have been able to send valuable information to our Italian colleagues and this guy has been arrested last week in Italy. And uh, this is really the kind of thing that we can do, but we need to go through the material to find uh, the jurisdiction, because it's very important for us. And then, as soon as we have the jurisdiction, we can take action, stop the perpetrators, and safeguard the victims. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the sad thing about this work is that it will never end. It will need to continue for as, as long as you know, as long as we keep going. Um, I just want to I just want to come back to you, Antonio, though, quickly talking about the regulation again. Um, the communication services have a big role in this. You've mentioned them a little bit already, and you mentioned the lack of reporting. Only three companies, you said. What? How much? How engaged are online companies with with 
what you're trying to do with this regulation? Well, uh, as I said before, there are only um, a few companies that are doing anything when it comes to preventing and combating uh, child sexual abuse uh, online. So uh, this um, regulation will put in place a mandatory regime. And the only obligation that will apply to all the relevant service providers will be the obligations to prevent these crimes from happening in the first place. And they are going to do that by assessing the risks that their services are used for distributing child sexual abuse material or for grooming uh, children. So we are talking about putting in place child safety by design. Then, if those mitigation measures that are put in place in the risk assessment process are not uh, sufficient to decrease uh, the risk, then uh, a process will start at the end of which those providers may receive uh, a detection order to detect uh, either known material or new material or uh, grooming, the online solicitation of children. But this will be a comprehensive, pro com comprehensive process where the necessity and proportionality of uh, the order will be assessed uh, very carefully by data protection authorities, by the EU center, national, national authorities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then the providers will have an obligation to report to the EU center any instances of uh, child sexual abuse online that they find in the services, regardless of how they have come across uh, that uh, material. And they will also have the obligation to remove this uh, material as soon as possible from the, the services or block access to it in case uh, the removal uh, is not possible. Now, to enforce uh, all these uh, obligations, there will be a system of uh, national authorities that will be created that will work together to ensure that uh, the providers comply with these uh, obligations. Yeah, it's going to be vital. Uh, just some final comments. Jean-Philippe, you're hopeful about this regulation, this proposal? Well, we absolutely, because we think that Europe has to react. We cannot rely on our partners to, uh, to do with, uh, with this, to deal with this uh, crime, in fact. And what is key for us as law enforcement to be able to take action is to have first a detection. And what we are looking for is to detect these uh, people, yeah. this exchange. And as soon as it is detected, then we are in a classical investigation under the supervision of judicial authorities done by law enforcement and uh, really. But what we miss at the, at the moment for the time being is to have been to be able to detect these exchanges on the, of child sexual abuse material. Yeah, it's really important. Javier, a final word from you. You've got so you're you're really pushing this now, and it's, it's yeah, in a good I, place. I'm, as a rapporteur, I'm, I'm I'm going to push hard. I think it's very necessary. Um, and um, uh, let's not forget that uh, Europe has a, a capacity not only to legislate for ourselves, but also to set global standards. And uh, I've just come from a mission. Uh, in, in, in Washington, we have had discussions with legislators. It is very likely that they will have um, this summer a, uh, a uh, an internet uh, or online uh, children protection act. So there is a general movement uh, towards uh, this awareness of the risks of internet for children, and we have to do that prevention, and then the measures that uh, Antonio has uh, has mentioned, and it's very important. It is unacceptable that uh, still many companies simply don't care about this problem. And, uh, and, and, and that is something we have to put right. Um, and, and, and we can, to some, extent, uh, to some extent, change the paradigm. Mm. There will be a mandatory obligation to say, well, if you're offering these services, please tell us uh, whether your service is vulnerable to child sexual abuse, and then uh, adopt the mitigation measures which are necessary. I think this is crucial. This is uh, reasonable. Everybody can understand that. Yeah.
it has to be done. Absolutely. Thank you so much to nice Javier Zazalea. Thank you so much, MEP. Um, we also have had Jean-Philippe Lecouf, the Deputy Director of Europol, and Antonio Labrador Jimenez. Thank you so much for being with us uh, for this conversation. I really appreciate the sensitivity uh, about this, and I think we've managed to sort of talk about uh, in a rounded way. Uh, yeah. And please continue. Everyone that's listened, uh, uh, please continue to follow this regulation because it's really significant. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.